Good afternoon. I'm Dan Longo, First Vice President of Commercial Lending at Liberty Bank. Today's CBIA presentation is about competitive compensation structure. All businesses have been uh, seen fast increases in salary for top performers in a, in a very tight labor market over the last couple of years. Uh, here at Liberty Bank, we're a 199-year-old mutual savings bank with over $7 billion in assets. We have over 55 branches throughout Connecticut and Western Massachusetts. I'm pleased to say that the CBIA and Liberty Bank have been partners together for many years. We're very proud of our series uh, sponsorship today, and I believe you're really going to enjoy our presentation today. So let me introduce Vlad Goish senior partner of Mercer, and Sophie Harp, a, an associate of Mercer also. Thank you, Dan. Nice to be with everyone today. We're uh, excited to continue this leadership series. We understand that you've heard from others on the topics of AI and culture and total rewards is certainly a hot topic as well. As Dan said, coming out of the great resignation and looking for performance and productivity from, from our staff. So if we want to pull up the slides, we'll uh, take you to the agenda. So we have three sections to our presentation today. And um, first, we'll start with job architecture, which is a fancy way of saying that before you can think about total rewards and compensation, you need a foundation. So having grades and levels and job families to organize your jobs, understanding what skills belong in which jobs is a very important framework for competitive compensation. And so we'll move on in the second section to talk about total reward strategy, the elements of total rewards and compensation. We'll touch a little bit on benefits, although that's really out of scope. And then um, we'll finish with a, a conversation around benchmarking and comparing compensation to market. And several of you, thank you for doing so in advance, several of you have su uh, submitted questions, which we will address as we go through our time today. However, to try to make this as interactive and as valuable as possible would really encourage us to post questions in the uh, webinar as we go through and we'll try to address those throughout. Or if you have specific questions or, or comments um, that you want us to address, feel free to put them in the chat or in the, in the questions as, as you can. So move, moving on to the first section of creating a job architecture as a foundation. When we think about what a job architecture is and how it creates the foundation for salaries and other compensation elements, we first start with career tracks. So career tracks, when you think about it, are different types of careers. People either become individual contributors or people managers. That's kind of the basic distinction, although there could be others. And in smaller organizations, there may not be a distinction. The managers may be doing the work as contributors and coaches at the same time as player coaches. However, it's, it's a good idea once you get above a critical mass to really consider whether management is suited for people who are really interested in being managers and who want to be managers and who have the aptitude and the skills for it. So career tracks should generally have the same types of skills. They don't necessarily have to have the same exact technical skills, but you can think about how executives probably need to have more of the strategic skills, the vision for the organization. Managers have more of those planning and people skills and individual contributors in many cases are really deep technical experts once they get to the top of their discipline. So to start with, we wanna think about career tracks. Now within the career tracks, we have career levels. And this is, you know, you've, I'm sure we've all heard the expression that's above my pay grade. That implies that your organization has grades. And so the grades in, in a best practice setting tie to career levels where the progression or the, the hierarchy as, as the ladder kind of shows is based on scope of the role and the responsibilities. So in the market, we've seen a shift away from things like years of experience or education and really wanting to define the roles and the expectations 
and the responsibilities that are associated with higher level roles. All right, so we've got career tracks and career levels. The other key piece of the job architecture are families and subfamilies. And this is where we think about the types of jobs that exist in organizations. So on this page, we've given examples of HR operations or talent acquisition as two subfamilies that exist within the HR family. You can also think about families like finance and, and many others. And depending on the size of your organization, you may have a lot or you may have very few. The point here is that when we think about compensation, which we'll get to in a, in a few minutes, different jobs and job families have different values in the market. And so this is an important way to set up career progression as well as the foundation for compensation. And Finally, last but not least, our skills. So when, when you've written job descriptions, you've likely talked about the abilities or the knowledge required for the job. And these skills are usually found in the job descriptions and lend themselves to different ways of recruiting, screening, interviewing, and, and I would argue as well for, for paying as well. And so the important thing is to go left to right to start with the most general and then get more and more specific. So we start with tracks, then within those tracks, we have levels, then we have families and subfamilies, which show how career progression happens. And then finally, we get to skills. I hope that makes sense. If anyone has any questions or if anything is unclear, as, as we said, please feel free to ask in, in the chat. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, so we'll keep going. Job architectures have been around for a very long time. What's different now is skills are becoming much more prominent. So you may have heard of competencies. Skills is the new term, but it refers to the ability or the knowledge uh, and, and the capacity of getting something done. So where the job architecture gives you the uh, opportunity to categorize the, the work into families and levels, the skills get more specific. So that's where you may have, if we're talking about a small company that, that's a small manufacturer, let's say, the work, people might be put in a level, but they need to have specific skills. They need to be able to use certain machines or understand enough about math to be able to run a, a specific process. So the, the skills are an, an emerging way to get very specific about what it is that we're paying for. And as you can see, there are benefits both to organizations and to talent. When we think about the workforce planning, right? So one of the things that uh, I was at a Hartford event that the CBIA did at, at some point in the last year, and there was a report that talked about how employee retention and hiring is very hard in Connecticut. So one of the things that you can benefit from in terms of workforce planning, for example, is understanding what skills you need to drive your business forward, which then helps you not just with hiring those people externally, but also from a talent performance perspective, helping people understand where they need to learn new things, what training, what classes they need to take so that their success is tied to your organization's success. And then last but not least, to stay with the topic of this briefing, there is a, a direct link to rewards, because if you can be clear about what skills and what proficiencies you need, you can then think about how to position your people to contribute in a way that will help you succeed as a business, but then also help them grow their compensation in their careers. So this is an example to give a very specific view of what we mean by job architecture, jobs, and skills. This is an example of a recruiter or talent acquisition. And you can see this is a senior professional. So if we look at the code at the top, HRM, et cetera, et cetera, the last three characters are P P30 or P3. So in, our, in the Mercer taxonomy and in many other taxonomies, a, a professional level three is a senior professional. Uh, if you think about a professional level one as an entry level university hire, a professional level three is someone who's probably mid-career and as, as the middle of the slide says, has advanced knowledge and experience. So com combining theory and practice. When we think about the skills that go into 
the job of being a recruiter, those are listed at the bottom. And we we have a view on skills by looking at what's happening in job postings. You as employers, we being Mercer as an HR consultancy, but you as employers have a great view on skills because you're working with your clients and customers and business leaders every day. And so when we think about the job architecture as a foundation, what, what we're talking about is taking your jobs, which already exist because you are uh, in business as a going concern, and trying to put them in a taxonomy or, or a framework that will enable you to be transparent with, uh, with your employees as well as candidates about what skills are needed to succeed and, and then ultimately where you may want to differentiate compensation. We move on um, to the next page. To wrap up this section, we wanted to touch on salary bands. So the idea is, if you think about job levels or career levels as the gray from one through seven, when companies build salary ranges, there are different ways to do it. And one way is to benchmark every single job. And we'll talk about that in the third section today. That can be okay for a smaller organization. It can get very cumbersome for larger organizations that have many jobs. So the salary structures look at the worth or the values of the job, but they're not an exact mirror image of the market. When we think about the minimum, the midpoint, and the max, it should have um, a linkage to the market where the vertical lines that are in the middle of the blue bars are the midpoint of the salary bands in this example. But they should also consider what we call internal equity or how people are paid internally doing similar work. So if we were to take any of these job levels, let's say job level four, in order to confidently place jobs in, and therefore people into that salary band, you first need a job architecture that we had talked about on the prior few pages. You need to figure out how many career levels you have, what job families exist, and then do some market pricing, which we'll come back to, to figure out what the market demands for the what it would cost to hire someone for these jobs. And when, once we do that, you can create salary bands that are a reflection of your job architecture and the market. So that jobs that are similar and are worth the same or very similar amounts internally as well as internally are grouped in the same band. Now, salary bands can get very specific. Some or larger organizations go as far as creating a version of this for every job family. So you might have IT salary bands and you might have HR and finance salary bands where people in the same career level could be compensated quite differently and even have different ranges. There's Pros and cons to that, I think the big downfall of creating too much specificity is that it just gets very complex and cumbersome. Now, on the flip side, if you have fewer bands, they typically tend to be broader, and that gives you flexibility. But then if they get very wide, you then have to be able to explain why certain individuals or certain jobs are placed higher or lower in the band. The last thing I'll say about salary bands is that in Connecticut, we've got the pay transparency law. Those laws are also becoming prevalent in many other states and municipalities. So if you are a larger company, you may have operations outside of Connecticut. But regardless, employers are now in a tough situation because we're posting these ranges externally because that's the law. But in some cases, our own employees who are here and have been at the company for a while don't have access to the same information. So the idea of salary bands has gotten much more traction because of the pay transparency laws. What many companies are finding now is that this is a great time to revisit their job architecture and build that foundation so that they can be confident in the salary bands that they're disclosing. So I'll pause here just to take a quick check. I'm not seeing any questions. Okay, I do see a question. What what role does the Bureau of Labor Statistics play in setting salary? That's a great question. Because one of the questions we got was, uh, what are some free sources of data for compensation? 
And this was so the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, was going to be one of the ones that we would mention. So what, what we would say is there's no direct, like it's not a causal relationship. The BLS doesn't necessarily cause setting salaries one way or the other, but it is a very good free source of data where we need to be careful with the BLS data is it talks about job types. I think they refer to it as, as, as occupations, but they don't necessarily talk about career levels. So they might provide information about accountants and in some cases, they also get into regional differences like metropolitan statistical areas, but they don't always get into what types of levels exist in accounting. So it's a really good source. If you're really unsure, I would kind of start with the BLS and then also look at, look, the best source, and I'm not just saying this because I'm, I'm uh, you know, at Mercer, the best source of comp data is surveys that have been where the consultancy collects data from other companies where it's vetted and there's a um, a job matching process where the company has to say, all right, my job level four is roughly a P4 in terms of Mercer and provides that data. That's by far the most robust uh, data source. Understanding that there are all sorts of companies in Connecticut and on this webinar we know not everyone wants to purchase surveys or can afford to purchase surveys. So I would say if you can't purchase surveys for Mercer or from other leading consultancies like WTW or Aon, then yes, go into the BLS and look at what they have to say about different jobs. Look at the Society of Human Resources Management or, or SHRM. Look at what, as you network with each other, whether it's the CBIA or other professional um, associations, it's fine to network and, and kind of triangulate. Just bear in mind that the federal government is very uh, skeptical about antitrust and collusion. So whatever you do, which is why it's another good point to use surveys from someone like Mercer is that we report data in ways that ensure confidentiality so that we won't, for example, give data out where there is very few, like two or three companies where someone could probably figure out by looking at the list of who participated in the survey, which company pays how much. So when you're networking, be, and we're not lawyers, so again, please don't interpret this as legal advice, but when you're networking with your peers, please be very sure to ask general questions. It's a very bad idea to start talking about what you plan on paying for specific jobs that that the government will definitely view as, you know, uh, suppression of wages and so forth. So that's why um, salary data is usually collected. Um, it has to be cleaned, but usually it's collected in April in many cases and then communicated later in September. It's always backwards looking. So it's very important that you think about the source of your data and also how you intend to use it. Um, there's another question that came in. Yes, uh, there are consulting companies that help with salary studies in the nonprofit space, and Mercer is one of them. So we would be very happy to, to help with that. Um, there are others, but um, again, like the, the thing with nonprofits is we understand that the, the financial model is a little bit different. But if you're hiring for certain roles, uh, like corporate roles, for example, you're in many cases competing with the for-profit sector. Um, so right now we're doing a study of research jobs with an Ivy League university. And that's the question we're, we're wrestling with. They are competing with healthcare systems, not necessarily other higher ed. So that's just one example. Um, and it's, it's, a, it, it's something that we can absolutely discuss offline. Thank you for the question. So if we move on, the second item we wanted to cover is compensation strategy. Okay, so now we've got, you've got your job architecture. There's a series of other questions that need to be answered. The first, of course, and that's what everybody always gravitates to is, is how much to pay. There's always a tension between employers and employees because employers, especially for-profit ones, wanna pay whatever will maximize profit. Employees want to obviously get paid as much as they can for, for their work. So that's where the context matters. That, that's where the peer group matters. Who are you competing with for your 
talent. And that may depend on the job. For um, if, if you're a manufacturer, you may be competing with other manufacturers for your frontline roles. But for your corporate roles, you could be competing with anyone who happens to have staff in, in that market. Pay positioning is also an important consideration. So most, and we'll talk about, Sophie will talk about this in the last section on benchmarking. Most companies want to position themselves somewhere around the median in the aggregate. So half of their peers are below and half are above. And that controls for things like performance or experience. But some companies, for example, in tech or life sciences, or maybe even in financial services, may choose to position themselves above that and maybe at the 75th percentile. So they're kind of going out there and saying, we want to pay in the aggregate more than three quarters of our competitors. So that's a, that's an important consideration and will guide where you end up setting your quantum or how much you're going to pay. What you pay for is, is also important because in many organizations, variable pay is an important component of total compensation and what you pay for kind of that you you walk you know the talk in that sense are you are you paying for profitability are you paying for revenue which is just growth without necessarily regard for the margin are you paying for lowering turnover right there's all sorts of performance measures that you could put in place and again you could probably probably do a webinar just on the topic of goal setting and performance metrics but it's a really important point, especially for variable compensation or sales compensation. So the linkage there refers to what are the rewards for good performance and what, what are the consequences of low performance? We, we almost never see people reducing salary, but it you know it's something that can happen if, if a role is getting re-leveled, for example. And then experience refers to uh, how do you account for experience versus responsibility? How to pay, that's how you deliver your pay. So when we think about differentiation, if, if you have goals and you have performance, you're gonna then consider whether you wanna, in comp speak, spread the peanut butter, meaning everyone gets about the same merit increase, or your higher performers might get a higher increase and your lowest performers may get nothing. Pay vehicles has to do with whether you're paying in cash or if you are a public company, are you considering giving equity, granting equity to certain senior people or key talent? And then risk and reward is that that has to do with pay mix. So how much of your total compensation is base salary versus uh, variable compensation? So in certain industries like financial services, it's very common for certain roles to have a lot of risk and reward. So there could be volatility year to year in how individuals get paid or, or for sellers, that's also very common. And there's a very strong linkage between the risk reward profile and when to pay. So traditionally for roles where there's a more leveraged pay mix, meaning they have more of their pay at risk, usually the payout timeframes are more frequent. So that's why we see sales compensation, usually instead of having annual incentives, if they're more on a commission type uh, plan, they get paid out every six months, in some cases quarterly. So this is a slide with a lot of content on it. I'll, I'll try to hit the highlights, but if, if you think about total rewards, there are numerous components to that. Let's start with total cash comp in the blue. So when we think of total cash comp, we're really talking about base salary and annual incentives, which could look like bonuses, which are more discretionary versus formal short-term incentives that have specific goals, meaning if, if the company achieves these goals and if the individual achieves those goals, then together that yields a, a relatively predetermined outcome for the variable comp. When we think about base salary, that's fixed. It's, it's what um, employees want. That's what pays the bills. Unless they're taking a big bet on themselves, few people are gonna opt for low base salaries and high incentives. So base salaries are important, but they're also fixed, which means they're by definition forward looking because you're committing to that 
based salary. It's just not market practice to lower salaries. Some companies did that during COVID, but I'm, I have not heard of a single company that actually made those reductions permanent. Most companies, if not all, restored those cuts. So if it's a fixed expense, then it needs to be forward looking. That's why we're saying that skills are becoming more of a determinant of salary because you want to invest for the long term in the skills that will help your business or your organization do what your organization needs to do. Annual incentives are more common in businesses as opposed to nonprofits, although we've seen that change as well in certain nonprofit settings. And, and the annual incentives, generally speaking, unless it's a sales role or some sort of manufacturing production bonus, take the form of a structured bonus plan, where if you think back to the job architecture, you have your career levels, the higher you go, the more pay is at risk. And it's usually communicated as a percentage of base salary. So that's total cash. If we add in long-term incentives, which really is equity in many cases, or owning a piece of the company, not always, but that's typically the case. Long-term incentives can also be cash-based, but when we say long-term, the key uh, difference is it's more than a year. So typically anything that's a year or less is annual incentives and goes into total cash comp. Once we introduce longer term performance periods, we get into long term incentives. And when you add LTI to total cash, you get total direct compensation. It's a complicated topic, not one that we necessarily have time for today, but we'd be happy to discuss offline if you are interested. The key problem that it solves is it aligns employees with owners. So that the, the point there is that if you put long term incentives in place, it makes sure that people are focused not just on how to make this quarter's results or this year's results. They're really thinking about how to generate long-term value. And then adding in benefits and perquisites to that, you get total remuneration. So benefits are what we're all familiar with, health insurance, 401ks, and so forth, perquisites as well. One area where we're seeing some innovation in the market is voluntary benefits. So there was one of the questions we got before the webinar was how can smaller employees be more creative in 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 using benefits and then and this is again where we're not lawyers we're also not tax advisors but talk to your tax advisors about the tax benefits of using things like 401k matches um, as opposed to paying them out as salaries so there's certain tax advantages with benefits but the point on voluntary benefits is an important one because there it refers to using an outside party to help your employees get the benefits that they want, things like pet insurance, home and auto. Maybe the reason they're voluntary is that they're kind of outside of the core benefits. And that can be a differentiator because depending on where you are in the state, whether you're in one of the cities or uh, more in, in a rural setting, having, for example, tax uh advantaged accounts for commuting may not make sense if pretty much everyone is driving to work. And then lastly, when we think about total rewards, we think about opportunities and careers. And that's where the job architecture becomes in itself a reward. Because at that point, let's say you choose, you say for, for affordability reasons, we can't be at the median. We Let's say you're at below median on compensation. There could be other reasons people come to work for you. Maybe it's work-life balance, maybe it's purpose and alignment with the mission. Virtually everyone, and, and, I, and I'm saying virtually because some people don't want this, but most people want to progress, whether that means learning new things, skills growth, or it could mean upward promotion. And so those opportunities to learn, to network, to grow are a reward element of themselves. And that's where it gets communicated as total rewards. I think we can move on. And uh, this is the last page before I take breath and pass it over to Sophie. But the last point in this section is we've talked about job architecture. We've talked about the elements of total rewards. Your overall reward strategy has to make sense in the context of your people strategy and your business, or if you're a nonprofit, your organizational strategy. What we mean by that is if, if you are a brand that 
positions itself as a luxury brand, let, let's say, then you probably have better margins and you probably are recruiting, at least for your key roles, people who are not average, they're above average, right? Like Apple, if you read the biography of Steve Jobs, he always talked about recruiting A players. So without debating you know, the merits of, of certain uh, leaders or their styles, the point stands that your reward strategy, if you're going to attract the best of the best, you can't pay like you're trying to attract the the average or or not the best of the best. So it all kind of has to align. And, and it's probably self-evident, but worth noting nonetheless, because we're throwing out a lot of concepts and all those concepts have to support what it is you're trying to do as an organization. So let me let me take a breath before I pass it over to Sophie. Are there any other comments or questions about anything that we've covered in the last few minutes? Okay, over to you. Thanks, Juan. Um, so we talked a lot about job architecture, about kind of compensation elements and philosophy. And now we're kind of getting into a very tactical topic of actually benchmarking compensation to the market, um, which is a key way to ensure that the compensation you're offering is competitive to what other organizations um, that you're competing for talent with are providing. Um, so I'm curious, maybe if uh, some of our participants here could type in the chat. I'm curious if anyone on the call has ever participated in a market benchmarking process, comparing your organization's pay to a survey um, for data and kind of everything that that entails. Let's see if we got some responses rolled in. Okay, Diane said every five years. Jyoti says yes. Yes. Twice a year. Agricultural surveys. Awesome. Okay, so it sounds like this won't be a totally foreign concept to a lot of you. Um, which is good, but hopefully everyone can learn something here today. Um, so it sounds like as many of us probably know, market pricing, um, also referred to as benchmarking, is used to assess the competitiveness of an organization's um, compensation to their employees relative to a, a an external market. Um, it can also be used to help identify gaps and uh, any retention risks if uh, there's an area where the organization is significantly underpaying the market. That would be a risk of, you know, someone kind of being poached by another organization. Um, on the other side of the coin there, if you're being over, if you're overpaying a, a certain job or a group of jobs relative to the market, there's uh, the opportunity there to kind of balance pay increases for, for other parts of the organization to kind of increase equity there. Um, it also helps inform compensation decisions, take some of the pressure off the decision making, being able to have kind of a, an external uh, data point to use in, in setting compensation levels. And ultimately, um, again, to help attract and retain employees and also motivate the right behavior from them. So as Vlad mentioned, market pricing is part of the overall pay philosophy, which needs to align with the overall uh, people and business strategies as well. So really having a sound pay philosophy of where uh, the organization wants to benchmark pay relative to the market uh, is important to help make decisions. Um, another decision that needs to be made before market pricing is which compensation elements um, we want to be, want. Uh, the organization wants to collect and actually benchmark and then which percentile benchmarking should be done against, um, which jobs in the organization should be included as benchmarks. We talked a bit about salary structures, uh, kind of, again, instead of benchmarking every single job individually, you can choose just a representative sample of jobs within that level to benchmark. And then that data can kind of be aggregated across the level to create a salary band there. Um, 
but making sure that it's important when you're selecting jobs that uh, the jobs that are being selected for the analysis are representative of the entire organization, not over-indexed on management or individual contributors or a certain function um, over another. And we talked about some different surveys that are available to use. Um, and some survey providers do have maybe more a higher client base in a certain industry. So it can be, can be um, you might choose a survey based on the industry, but um, as we'll talk about later, it's having more surveys is always better. And most vendors do offer several different products and ways to cut the data to really hone in on uh, the relevant market that should be or should be compared against. I just want to address a question on the cost of the benchmarking exercise. It's a great question. It depends. It depends on the approach. So one way to do it is to work with a firm like Mercer to do the work on your behalf. And there, the fees are usually a function of the number of jobs, because if you have more jobs, it, as you would expect, requires more time to pull the data and so forth. That can get expensive if you have a lot of jobs, if you're a large organization and you don't necessarily have the budget for it. What could be more cost effective is purchasing the surveys directly. And typically, the as Sophie was saying, different firms have different specializations um, or different industries like Coupa is a good survey for higher ed. And uh, purchasing those surveys directly is usually more cost effective. The downside is that when you purchase the data, you're just getting the data. You're not getting any consulting support outside of just, you know, like help desk type questions, like how do we access the data? So then it falls on internal colleagues to do the job matching, create the reports and interpret the data. So what many larger organizations tend to do is they do benchmarking studies every several years. And um, then they use the results of those studies to create salary ranges, which they then update annually as opposed to doing larger benchmarking uh, every year. Any Anything you would want to add to that? Uh, no, I agree. Um, we do have another question come in about survey data being backwards looking, which is true. So surveys, like when Mercer is publishing a survey, we collect the data. Um, I think data collection is going on right now for our survey that will be published at the end of this summer for 2024. And so the the way that we deal with that is through a process called aging, where um, in addition to compensation data, we collect a lot of information from our clients about the comp planning process. And one of those is kind of um, planned budgets for increases in the coming year. And then we can use that apply it to the backwards looking data. And then that kind of gives us a better look as to what those salaries will look like one year forward once uh, the companies go through their compensation adjustment period where they're making merit increases. Uh, so again, we'll cover that a little bit later on, but um, hopefully that helps. Oh, one other thing I wanted to say on that point is they're backward looking by design. Part of it is around antitrust concerns from the government. Um, but honestly, if you want real-time data, talk to your talent acquisition team. They're usually a really good source to understand if there are emerging skill sets uh, or, or candidate, changing candidate expectations. All right, so we mentioned benchmarking data against a, a relevant market. And what we mean by that is you know, taking the survey data and kind of um, honing in on uh, the specific population that your organization is competing with for talent. Um, so again, thinking about where uh, different industries or specific organizations or maybe geographies where you recruit talent from and where when you lose talent, where do they tend to go? That's kind of a good way to think of who exists in your kind of competitive market there. Um, sometimes the market might be depending on the size of the organization. Primarily, we think about this when we're benchmarking executive, executive roles. So for example, the CEO of a small startup and the CEO of a large public company, 
those are two very different jobs. And when, you know, say Aetna is looking for a new CEO, they're probably not going to go to the four person startup down the street and look for that CEO to join Aetna. So um, in those cases, the size of the organization and kind of the complexity of the executive role becomes important when, uh, when benchmarking and you really want to benchmark executive and sub senior management roles to uh, organizations of, of similar complexity. Um, and then for jobs where individuals are on site and there is a need to recruit for a specific geographic area, there are some um, specific geographic uh, surveys, but in general, it's more common to use a geographic differential. So um, Mercer publishes that data as well as um, some other sources, the Economic Research Institute we use a lot. Um, and that data is kind of the difference of, of cost of labor in different um, different parts of the country. And that you can apply that differential to the data to get a better idea of what, um, what a more relevant pay level would be in a specific geographic area. Um, again, thinking about executive versus non-executive roles, the the location isn't as important for executive roles. We typically consider that a national market for talent. Um, so really just thinking about geographic differentials for management and um, individual contributor employee level uh, roles. And then oftentimes, if there is a specific industry knowledge that's needed, you'll want to size or scope the survey rather for a specific industry or use an industry specific survey itself. Um, and that kind of gives an idea of some, if industries pay differently, um, it gets a, it gives you a sense of what the pay level is for individuals who have the specific industry expertise that you're looking for as compared to uh, more of a generic uh, industry approach. Um, there was a question about, could we repeat what was said about accessing real-time data? Um, most survey providers like Mercer, Aon, WTW, and so forth, collect their data and then publish it, and it's backward looking because, for example, we're collecting it in April and we'll publish it in September. Part of the reason for that is it takes time to collect and clean, make sure the data is valid and reliable. Part of that is concerns from the government, from the federal government around antitrust, meaning they don't want to see employers coming together and talking about forward-looking salaries or intentions around how much they want to pay certain jobs, because that's like anything else, that that's collusion and trying to um, limit competition. So what we're saying is if you want to access real-time data, you can talk to your recruiters because they're uh, as another source because they're getting people on board as, as we speak. And another good thing to do is to take the survey data and then apply a process called aging, which refers to if you if the survey says somebody's paid $100,000, most survey vendors also tell you on average what other companies are doing by way of merit increases or other cost of living increases. Let's say that increased 3% then you would adjust or age the survey. Instead of using 100,000, you would, let's say that the factor is 3%, you would say it's 103,000. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, we're very happy to follow up offline. Um, so we talked a little bit about data selection. Um, again, different survey providers include Mercer, Towers, Aon, McLogan, um, we see these pretty commonly. And usually we recommend using at least two surveys in the benchmarking process. That just kind of helps get a broader participant um, profile uh, and just using multiple sources to kind of um, validate, for example, um, if, if one survey is over-indexed with participants in a certain industry, having that second one can help balance it and just getting multiple um, sources there for validity. And then again, when we talked about size and uh, industry cuts, um, but choosing when you tend to apply multiple. So if you apply revenue cut and an industry cut, the data might get, it might be too few companies reporting to actually get reliable data. So usually we recommend choosing a single best um, 
cut to have a, a good sample size of data to, to, um, to analyze. And then along with that, using incumbent weighted as opposed to organization weighted data. So organization weighted, it, it only provides one, um, one answer from every company who submits essentially, whereas incumbent weighted, if, you know, if Apple is um, submitting for their entire finance department, each individual employee within their finance department provides one observation in the survey. So you tend to get greater sample sizes using incumbent weighted as opposed to organization weighted data there. And then weighting the data. So again, if you're using multiple surveys, typically you would want to weight them equally, or if one is maybe a little more relevant for the industry, you could weight that higher, but we typically recommend weighting them equally. You can also blend multiple benchmark jobs together. So um, if the survey has kind of standard benchmark jobs that you match your organization's jobs to. And sometimes there isn't one perfect job in the survey that, that makes sense for um, the role in your organization. So you might choose a couple and then weight them either equally or if, if you know the responsibilities are more of one than the other, you could weight that one higher. Um, but again, a simple approach and what we typically recommend is just weighting evenly. Um, when you are selecting benchmark jobs to use, a good rule of thumb is to look for 70 to 80 percent overlap in the job description and the responsibilities of the job. So, you know, again, the benchmark job might not have every single thing that the, the role in your organization is responsible for. But if there's an 80 percent overlap, that tends to be the pay tends to um, align there. Um, and then we talked about aging already. And again, when sample sizes get small, sometimes the data is not available or it, it doesn't make any sense. The, you know, the 75th percentile is higher or lower than the, the median or something like that. So typically you want to look for uh, a job match where there are at least 10 organizations and over 10 incumbents to kind of have uh, uh, valid data. And if they're, if the, job that you're looking for or the survey cut that you're using doesn't have valid data, you can use a broader scope. So instead of scoping for the industry, just use the general industry um, cut of the data or move to a similar, um, but maybe more prevalent job, um, job match for that, uh, for that role. And then again, aging, um, we discussed aging it to a common date. Typically it's whatever date your merit increases would be effective. So at Mercer, our salary increases go into effect on April 1st. So when we are aging data, if we were aging data for Mercer, we would age it then to April 1st of the next year. So just a couple of things to highlight. When, um, I don't know how many of you are compensation professionals as opposed to business owners or other roles. I, I would probably guess that most people here are not rewards professionals. So if you are not a rewards professional and you're on the receiving end of rewards data, this is an important slide and important um, questions to ask your HR team, such as what surveys were used to show me whatever it is you're showing me, tell me who the survey providers were. Furthermore, you should ask, who participated in the survey? If it's a reputable survey like Mercer, WTW, Aon, if it's Coupa for those educational institutions, they should be able to very easily pull a list of which institutions participated in the survey. You should also ask what is the, the sample size, meaning how many organizations and how many employees are represented by this data? That's why that's a really important point and why you don't want to rely exclusively on just Googling, right? We get that question a lot. Well, I can just Google what this person makes. Yeah, you can, but the question is who put that data in, who reviewed it to make sure that it's, you know, a like for like role for your job, and how many people actually put that data out there. So really, I know there's a lot of text and concepts here, but those are like foundational questions that you should be asking your HR team to keep them accountable and make sure that what they're giving you is, is a valid representation of the market. Thank you. 
Um, so that kind of brings us to the end of the content here. So again, we're going to open it up and welcome anyone with questions to uh, flow those into the Q&A or the chat. Um, just to summarize everything that we talked about, first step to having a competitive compensation structure is to have a solid job architecture where you can reliably level jobs within the organization to understand their relative um, value to the organization and then base the compensation benchmarking on that leveling there. Um, and again, reward strategy, making sure that always aligns with the people strategy and reinforces the overall business strategy as well. Uh, market pricing is an important piece of ensuring competitiveness as it allows you to benchmark your jobs against kind of the external market there. And again, really important when you're looking at survey data that you're looking at a relevant market. So those you're making sure that the, the survey data you're getting is reflective of the organizations that you are competing with talent for, whether that's uh, whether that's from an industry perspective, a geography perspective, a size perspective, or you know, for some organizations, if it's a finance role. They can. It doesn't matter what industry they came from. It could be you know they could hire a finance professional from a tech firm or a nonprofit. Um, in which case, using a general industry might be appropriate there. But in some, in a lot of cases, you really want to make sure that you're honing in on the specific. Um, the specific experience that you'll be looking for in that uh, in when you go out to hire for that role. Great. So I, as we said, this is about competitive compensation and how you define competitive is a very important question. So hopefully this was uh, helpful. I see we still have 45 people on out of 50. So that's pretty good. That means people stayed on. Um, we have a few minutes left and we'd love to hear any feedback uh, you know, if you if you disagree with anything we said, by all means, uh, questions, any kind of feedback is welcome. Um, if if you don't have any feedback or you'd rather not um, mention it publicly, I just put my email address in the chat. I'm uh, and thank you, Sophie. <laughs> Our, uh, you can use your phone if you want to connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, Yes, I, I do think this recording will be made available. Um, the CBA could certainly comment on that, but I, my understanding is that it is going to be shared. Um, any additional comments on culture and how you've noticed it affects retention? It's a really good question. And I think the, the compensation is foundational. It can ensure that you're attracting and getting people in the door. I think for retention, culture is really what, what is important because the culture is what makes your firm unique. People can find out, as we, ju we just spent an hour talking about how to get comp data. So comp data, even if it's not your comp data, it's, it's out there. It's relatively easy to understand what a job is worth, but it's more than just the comp. People come to work and more importantly, stay at your job, at your company because of the culture. And uh, so, so yes, I think that we've seen that with companies um, wanting to retain key skills, especially frontline roles. There was a, an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal recently about for frontline roles, they they um, ended up opening a, an on-site daycare and that has really helped for attention. So they're not necessarily paying people more, but they're investing in, in something that makes sense for their workforce. And, and culture has to honestly be, it's more than just words. Um, do you wanna take the next one? Do you, the one about sharing salary studies? Sure. Um, I think it really depends. Um, in your specific example, sharing with a single employee, probably not if you're not, um distributing that more broadly i don't know if you would agree with that vlad but um i think transparency is definitely something in in the research that mercer has published most recently that employees are really um looking for in their employer and value very highly is transparency so i think the more um information you know that is shared from an employee point of view they tend to value that again making sure that that's shared 
um, not just with a single person, but broadly in that the information that you are sharing, it makes sense. For example, um, with pay transparency and, and companies publishing salary ranges, oftentimes if you look at uh, you know, a job posting, the salary range might look really crazy, like 50,000 to 150,000 or something like that. If that's your salary range and you share that with an employee, they might be very confused. Why is it so wide? If it could go up to 150,000, why am I at 75,000? So um, it kind of depends on, on the organization, the way that your salary structures are set up, but certainly uh, publishing with the increase of pay transparency, it's something that employees are valuing and publishing salary structures does help build trust with your uh, workforce. Yeah. You got anything there? Well, I think just to answer the question, it sounds like there is a specific case. So I guess to preface this, I would say nothing that we say is gonna apply in each and every situation, but it sounds like there's this individual who continues to reference Glassdoor. So I think you can refer to some of the things we've talked about in this presentation about how self-reported data isn't as reliable as surveys from a reputable source. And if you have done those studies and you feel like the ranges that you have are meaningful, I don't think there's anything wrong with talking about the ranges and turn the conversation away from, why am I not paid this amount that's on Glassdoor to, here's the salary range, let's talk about why you are where you are and what skills you need to progress. The other thing I would say in terms of transparency, Salary is just one component, right? So it's very important. We always see things like the employee assistance program. People don't know about it unless they need it, unless they're in bereavement or something. So be open and, and transparent about the things that you do offer. Also, if you're going to be transparent about compensation, it, it stands to reason you should be transparent about the business. Many private businesses don't have the same obligations as public corporations to disclose, and so that they might be hesitant to tell employees how the business is doing. Okay, that, that's fine. You don't have the obligation to do it, but as Sophie was saying, individuals are expecting transparency, and so it's one thing to say, here's the salary range, but you have to add the context to say, we're having, a. am I'm, I'm making this up, but let's say you're having a slowdown. You can say, look, we're having a slowdown. Our customers are delaying orders where less cash is coming in. That obviously has to factor in into how, I mean, maybe it's obvious to employers, probably not so obvious to employees, but that has to factor in into how you set your pay. So I think that transparency goes beyond just compensation. All right. We have a question in the Q and A here about um, how to deal with long term employees that have kind of hit the the max of their pay structure. Um, Diane says we've created career ladders within roles, but still find several are at the end of the ladder and still have a few more more years left. Do you have any advice on to how to handle that, Vlad? Um, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I hadn't seen it. How to deal with long term employees that have hit a max? Oh. Um... Yes. Ba basically, the answer is yes. It's what you said, Diane. Um, red, and just for everyone's benefit, red circling is an HR term. It refers to the fact that when the individual leaves, that role will be filled at a lower pay grade. Um, so yes, once someone hits the maximum or goes over the maximum of the range, it is market practice. And we typically do advise clients to do lump sum bonuses. But again, it goes to the question of whether how critical that individual is to retain, right? Because in a in an environment where we're in now with inflation, if you don't give someone an increase or a lump sum, it, it in real terms they're getting a pay cut, and it does send a message that maybe you don't need them as much as they think you do. But but yeah, that's a, that's a tough one when people are above the max. It does become challenging. And if they don't want to move up or don't have the skills to move up, it's it's a it's a challenging situation. Yeah, I would say in general, upskilling is is a way to um, you know help the individual take on new skills that are maybe more could be applied to a different role or the skills that might be more valuable to the organization and allow for higher pay. Um, obviously, if it's someone at the end of their career maybe upskilling isn't what they're looking for there, but that's another way to kind of create some growth 
room for growth in um, someone's pay. We are, we're out of time, but I just want to say that many, not all, if not most, let me say that we baby boomers will probably retire by 2030. So it, it, at that point, it may be less about upskilling and maybe more about succession and training the next generation. So when you do these lump sum bonuses, you may want to tie those bonuses to milestones, such as making sure that the next generation is, is up to speed. Okay, well, thank you so, so much. We want to let you get on with your day. Uh, we really appreciate the engagement and, and the questions. And as we said, we're here if you have any follow-ups for us. Thank you all and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.